Well, it is great to be here with all of you. First, I want to get a sense. How many of you are from New York City? OK, pretty good. Looks 50-50. How many of you have been to New York City in the last five years? Ooh, last three years. Ooh, last year. OK, so our tourism program is apparently working. <laughs> and. Uh, before I get started, all of you work in organizations where you know that it's not about you that are delivering change and products on the ground. It is about the people that actually you work with that make those kinds of changes happen. And before I get started, I want to recognize the 4,500 men and women at the New York City Department of Transportation who not only take care of your roads and bridges and ferry rides each and every day, but they were the ones that actually made the changes that I'm going to talk about happen on the ground. And one of them uh, is my colleague and co-author, Seth Salamano, who actually can tell you all about the kinds of slings and arrows that we took along the way um, uh, uh, for these changes. So I'm going to start with a question. What do you guys think about when you think about a street? This is actually a question. <laughs> what do you think about when you think about a street? Sidewalks. Sidewalks. Thoroughfares. Thoroughfares. Cleanliness. Cleanliness? Cleanliness? That's the first time I've heard that one. <laughs> potholes, potholes. Roadblocks. It is UN General Assembly Week, so we're seeing a lot of those. Well, most people, when they think about uh, a street, they think about a scene like this. And scenes, streets are, oh, that's not, there we go. Um, streets are what makes some cities great and some cities not so great. And for decades, our streets were governed by a kind of dashboard view of the road. Our leaders would look at streets like this and say, yep, everything's working just fine. But it wasn't always that way. Our streets used to accommodate streetcars and horse carriages and buggies and bikes. And they were more like our living rooms with lots of choices to get around. This actually is Mott Street 100 years ago. And this is it today. And you can see the choices for getting around have just been whittled away. And our streets have really morphed into highways. And streets can be really lively places for people. But for most of the last century, they have been places for cars with devastating consequences. 35,000 people dying every year on our streets, congested streets, lifeless streets. And this didn't happen by chance. This actually happened by design. And this design had an impact for how we all got around. I mean, you look at a street like this, you don't see any people on it. Is that because people don't want to walk? No, it's because the street doesn't give them any choices. And it reminds me of this video game that I used to play called Frogger. How many of you played Frogger? Right? We all played Frogger. I actually think that this game could easily have been called Pedestrian. And here is a real life translation. There are all sorts of signs for how a street wants to be used. And you can see it when people are trying to cross it mid-block. And this is a sign of how our streets have let people fall through the cracks. And you look like at a street like this and you think, you know, people seem to have gotten so tired of constantly battling cars that they just gave up the fight, that they forgot that it could be any different. Not that it was a fair fight. Um, the national standards from our streets come from the federal government, uh, and they do everything from dictating what, what the size of the fonts are on our street signs to the width of our lanes. It's like the Ten Commandments, but 500 pages long with the best clip art money can buy. <laughs> they just forgot one thing, people. If you read all 500 pages, you won't find a single person uh, in, in the book. And an emoji interpretation looks like this. You start with a city, you add some roads, throw in some stoplights, take out those pesky pedestrians, and voila! You get a fast, fast cars, a fast street, and lots of engineers celebrating yet another job well done. Just don't try to cross that street on foot. But it doesn't have to be that way. It is possible to reclaim, to redesign, to reimagine our streets. It just awaits those who care and those who dare. And the stakes are high. 
Um, right now, half the world lives in cities, and that number is expected to grow to 66% by 2050. And so all of the growth that's happening is in cities. So how we design them matters to the future of the world. And Mike Bloomberg recognized that when he uh, released Plan YC, the New York City Long Range uh, Sustainability Plan, which is looking at how are we going to accommodate the million more people that were expected to move to New York City by 2030 and still improve the quality of life in neighborhoods and business districts. It had profound implications for how we used our streets, and we translated that plan into a new strategic plan for the Department of Transportation, which, by the way, had never had a strategic plan, which is kind of astonishing. So we ended up, by the end of the Bloomberg administration, we created 400 miles of bike lanes. How many of you have been on those bike lanes? Yes. We created 60 pedestrian plazas. Plazas? Excellent. Uh, seven new rapid bus lines. Bus lines, not so much. Um, and we launched the largest bike share in North America. Yeah, city bike. And we have the safest streets in 100 years. But that's the short version. The slightly longer version is that every day was a fight to give people more choices for getting around. And we were fighting to change the culture of New York and to set it in a new direction. And I learned a lot of lessons uh, along the way. And one of the first lessons that I learned is that you can paint the city you want to see. And like any city, we had to start with the streets that we had and the budget that we had. And I found that you can accomplish a lot just with the supplies that you have on hand. And we wanted to show New Yorker that change was possible. This is Times Square in the 1950s. And this is Times Square some 60 years later. Not much had changed. And think about it. If you didn't change your major capital asset in 50 years, do you think you'd still be in business? So a few months after my appointment, we created the first pedestrian plaza in Brooklyn on Pearl Street. We just painted it, put tables and chairs, painted a curb. It didn't take years of planning studies. It didn't take millions of dollars. We just showed people the possible. And we turned what had been a place to park into a place that people wanted to be. And we did these kinds of transformations all over town. This is on 9th and 14th Street. Uh, we created Manhattan's first pedestrian plaza, turning street space into uh, seat space. An Apple store moved in. People are there 3 AM, 3 PM. It's actually hard to remember uh, what it used to look like, because when you adapt a space, people adopt it. This is at Madison Square, which used to be one of the largest intersections in New York City at 170 feet. And we took that wide intersection and the warren of lanes that were there, 23rd Street, 5th Avenue, um, Broadway, and we created 65,000 square feet of new public space. And we coned it off, and two hours after we coned off the space, this art class materialized out of nowhere. You know, they just came and started sketching, and it just shows how hungry New Yorkers are for public space. And today, it is one of the most successful public spaces in New York City. In fact, people choose to sit in the street in the plazas rather than in the park next door, just to feel the pulse of the city. Didn't take a lot of time, didn't take a lot of money. So after creating this kind of showcase of projects that we did all across the city, we took our toolkit to the crossroads of the world, to Times Square. And since many of you are New Yorkers, you know that most of Manhattan's on a grid north, south, east, west, and Broadway cuts irregularly through that grid on an angle. And it does great things. It creates these plazas, you know, Times Square, Herald Square, Union Square. But it also creates congestion, these hot spots of congestion, because you have to go through three intersections instead of two. And people would trade the safety of the sidewalk for the street just to get by, because as New Yorkers, we go crazy when we have to wait behind people. It drives us insane. We want to get around in a New York minute. And what happens is tourists come to Times Square, and generally, they just walk four people abreast, right? Like that. They're just walking four people abreast. And we can't stand it. And we vibrate. And we jump into the street, and we get hit by cars, and it's not good. So we had 350,000 people going through Times Square every day, and lots of people who tried lots of things to fix it. Nothing worked. So I brought this idea to Mike Bloomberg. And I said, we've got this idea to close Times Square on Broadway from 47th to 42nd Street. Um, we're going to do it as a pilot. We'll see if it works. We'll try it. If it works, we'll keep it. If not, we'll put it back. 
And um, people could see and touch and feel the changes instead of like trying to convince them with um, a big engineering drawing. And so I remember um, pitching it to Mayor Bloomberg, and he turned to me and he's like, you know, what the fuck? <laughs> what? Are you crazy? Closing Times Square? And, but then he kind of thought about it, listened to the presentation, we went through it a lot, and he, he became very comfortable with it. And then I remember I presented it, you know, in um, City Hall, there are like two floors, and there's a committee of the whole room which has got this big like Knights of the Round Table kind of from Camelot kind of era. And all of the deputy mayors were arrayed around the table. And he went around the table and he asked everybody, all the deputy mayors, what they thought about this idea. Now, I might add that this idea was being proposed in the middle of a re-election campaign in the summer. And so let's just say that not everybody thought that this was a great idea. And I will never forget, um, uh, Mayor Bloomberg turned to me and he said, you know, I don't ask my commissioners to do the right thing according to the political calendar. I ask my commissioners to do the right thing, period. And he shook my hand and he said, let's do it. And, which was very exciting. And so we closed it off uh, and um, people came out immediately. Um, they knew exactly what to do. We put these beach chairs out there. Um, you know, every project has a problem. There's not a single one of you that has been involved in a project or a program that hasn't had a glitch along the way. So we thought we were very confident. We'd done all the outreach for this project. It was going to work. We put out the orange cones, and we suddenly realized the night before, oh, we don't have anything out there in this space. What are we going to do? So we actually went to Pinchick Hardware Store, and, <laughs> and we bought 1099 beach chairs, and we put all of those beach chairs out there. In the, in the space, and the best part of it was that the next day, everybody loved the beach chairs. The press wrote about nothing about that we had closed Times Square to cars, but they all wrote about the beach chairs. Did you like the color of the beach chairs? <laughs> the size of the beach chairs? Anything about the beach chairs? So I'm telling you, if you have a big project that's going glitchy, think beach chairs. <laughs> it works. And for New Yorkers, and some of you in this room who wouldn't be caught dead in Times Square, it became a new kind of living room. And the reconstruction work um, continues today um, with permanent seating and digital infrastructure that's worthy of its name the crossroads of the world. And I actually have one of those little beach chairs in my office today. Uh, it's a little piece of New York, but it's, this kind of example is a model that any city can follow. And by any measure, it was a big success. And we did a lot of measuring because I work for a data-driven mayor. Uh, he used to say, in God we trust, everyone else bring data. <laughs> and so we did. And we called our plan Green Light for Midtown, and because we wanted to make it clear that we were going to keep traffic moving. But we were also going to go beyond just looking at traffic flow. We were going to look at safety. We were going to look at um, economic returns. And we found 80% fewer people walking in the street, uh, pedestrian injury and uh, motorist injuries way down and travel times uh, had actually improved. And it was an economic blockbuster. Six new retail st st uh, stores moved in. According to Cushman and Wakefield, it became one of the top 10 retail locations on the planet. And we used this new economic analysis on our other projects to track not just what happened curb to curb, but also what happened at the cash register. On streets that had protected bike lanes, we saw retail sales surge 50%. And we saw similar returns on our plaza projects and on our bus projects. And these kinds of figures turned small business owners, who used to be some of our biggest opponents, into some of our strongest uh, supporters. And we moved from streets that were governed by anecdote to streets that were governed by analysis. But economics aside, nothing is more important than safety on our streets. And we committed to cutting traffic fatalities by 50%. And we did that by uh, embarking on the largest traffic safety study ever done in the United States. We studied 7,000 crashes over four years. It be we looked at the who was getting hit, the why, the when they were getting hit, uh, and the how of it. And we used those findings to um, prioritize our work. And this kind of data-driven approach is being used now by mayors all around the country, from San Francisco to Los Angeles to Seattle and LA. And they are committing to Vision Zero because they understand that with analysis and leadership, uh, traffic crashes can be prevented and predicted. And it also demonstrates that great ideas cross borders. And no one has a uh, patent on pavement. Every city is unique, but we all face some of the same problems, and we don't have to reinvent the wheel. So when you think of something that you think might work in your city, try it out. 
And shortly after I started, I actually traveled to Bogota to see the kind of innovations that had put them on the map, um, including their BRT system, which took trips that used to take hours into minutes. And it was a great lesson for New York City, because New York City has the largest bus fleet in North America and the slowest bus speeds. As my chief engineer used to say, the only way to get across town is to be born there. <laughs> so that's not a great strategy for a world-class city. So we implemented this bus rapid transit concept, called it select bus service, dedicated lanes, you pay before you get on the bus, the traffic light holds the light green longer for the buses, um, and we have cameras enforce the lane so that if a driver's in that lane, it gets a ticket if it's um, uh, during um, key peak periods. We created seven lines in all five boroughs in six years, 20% reduction in travel time, 10% in tr in increase in ridership, we also went to Copenhagen. How many of you have been to Copenhagen? Ooh, that's quite a bit. So you know how cool Copenhagen is. And we were there for the first time, and just like almost everybody else in American traffic management, we'd never seen a protected bike lane before. And we went around the city with Jan Gell, and we saw that there must be a better way. And we translated Copenhagen's protected lanes here, on the, creating the first ever parking protected bike lane on 9th Avenue in Manhattan. And what we did is we just, the parked cars just moved out one lane and they served as the protected barrier for the cyclists. Very simple. And it was the start of a new era for cyclists. And we expanded this uh, in corridors all across the city. And we also dramatically expanded our bike network. This was our bike network in 2007 and this was our bike network in 2013. And I love showing this because it looks so easy. You just, yeah, paint the lines, no problem. Everybody likes it. Um, no worries about taking away parking spaces. So, uh, and now we're seeing these protected bike lanes, you know, surge across the country since we put the first one in 10 years ago. And it's thanks to word of mouth and organizations like the National Association of City Transportation Officials that have codified this guidance so that these kinds of designs aren't just one-offs, they become codified now. They are the new standard operating guidance for streets in the United States certified by USDOT. We're doing a global guide on the right in launching that in October. And you know that there's a seismic shift underway when a place like Los Angeles is putting in a parking protected lane. And other cities, Seattle, Indianapolis, Atlanta, and Chicago. But it is not just about moving bikes. It is also about moving people. And by following their footsteps, you can see what is possible, what is hidden in plain sight. So let me show you what I mean. You've, you've been to New York City. You may recognize the street. This is 51st Street. This is a mid-block crossing between 6th and 7th Avenue. Um, people used to cross illegally because they didn't want to didn't want to walk what was the equivalent of two football fields, you know, to the um, avenues. And so we followed what they did, and we channeled a little marketing magic and, cre and Harry Potter, and we created Six and a Half Avenue. And, you know, just by looking at where people were walking and following their footsteps, um, we made the kinds of changes that needed to happen on the ground. And this theory applies almost everywhere you look. This is uh, trampled grass in the Bronx, where the neighborhood was clearly crying out for a sidewalk. And you can see where people uh, are walking and what needs to be done. And following the people doesn't just stop with street design. Um, we actually turned the community engagement process on its head by asking neighbors where they wanted these plazas to be. And they came together, neighborhoods, business districts, improvement districts, and they got the political sign off for these projects and they would actually apply for them. And they took ownership of the plazas that we would create. And we created a whole series of application programs so people could apply for street seating, they could apply for bike corrals, they could apply for bike racks, they could even apply for limited edition David Byrne bike racks. I mean, look at those, Miss Mudflaps in Times Square. How cool is that? And we worked very hard to bring new life to old surfaces, from bridges to Jersey barriers. And in a city where this actually used to pass as public seating, which is not great for families with kids or seniors, 
uh, we created a new bench program and we asked people where we should put them and we put a thousand of them all over town. We also started a wayfinding system to make it easier for people to navigate the city because we did a survey and we found out that at any given time, 10% of New Yorkers were lost. <laughs> lost. And those, that's just the ones that would admit it. So we knew we had a problem um, and we made it easier for them to get around and we asked them where we should put these new wayfinding signs. Leads me to another point. The public domain is the public's domain and they are gonna do everything they can to defend it, improve it, to put it back the way it was. So a city government that's naturally looking to do good, big things is gonna have a push-pull relationship uh, with these community groups. And building those relationships is just as important as anything that you put down in concrete, asphalt, and steel. And we did that for all of our projects. Massive outreach, bus projects, bridge projects, all of our projects. And the advocates played a crucial role, and there is a growing number of New Yorkers that are passionate about their streets and fighting to take them back, whether it's community leaders like Eric McClure, Paul Steely White, Brad Lander, Eric, uh, Clarence Eckerson, organizations like Families for Safe Streets who channeled their own experience and meaningful loss into action, pushing through uh, the first time that we lowered uh, the city's speed limit. But if I've made this sound easy, uh, it wasn't. There were some bumps along the way. Uh, this is a very infamous street in New York. Anybody know what street this is? This is Prospect Park West. Um, doesn't look like it would be an infamous street, right? But the community asked us to fix it. There was a lot of speeding, cyclists riding on the sidewalk. So we put in a two-way protected bike lane. Uh, speeding went down 75%, uh, bike ridership tripled, nobody riding on the sidewalk. All good, right? Everything happening like it should? Not so much. Uh, as I learned, when you push the status quo, the status quo pushes back hard. Although creatively, I like the don't con be conned by Sadakon. I thought that was clever. <laughs> um, so... But these were protesters who came up uh, to object to the fact that we made the street slower, saying that these slower speeds somehow made the street less safe. And one local newspaper called it the most contested slab of concrete outside the Gaza Strip. <laughs> and you can see what they found so threatening, right? I mean, who would want to live next to a scene like this? So we were actually sued, and I actually testified in the lawsuit like six months ago, you know, six years after this lawsuit was filed. If this lawsuit was a child, it would be old enough to ride in this bike lane. But bike lash is not just a New York phenomena, and you've been there, you've probably seen some of the symptoms when you start to see headlines like these. And a surreal part of the bike lash and the backlash is having to defend actions that make streets safer rather than leaving them in their dangerous status quo state. But you have to stand your ground and not make decisions based on press. And so when we launched City Bike, massive City Bike system, we did the biggest outreach in uh, the city's transportation history. The system had 6,000 bikes, 330 stations. It's now at 10,000. We knew it would be popular, but we knew we would also be criticized along the way. And one local magazine um, analyzed why City Bike had such strong reactions, that New Yorkers didn't like anything healthy, environmental, that involved sharing, or was vaguely French. <laughs> true, rings true, right? A, and a tipping point in the backlash came from this Wall Street Journal video rant. An editorial board member called us bike crazed, and she said she represented the majority of New Yorkers who were opposed to the bikes, that they begrimed the city. We had to look that up. We didn't even know what that meant, be grimed the city. She also called out the advocates, saying they were part of this all-powerful bike lobby that was working hand-in-hand -hand with the totalitarian mayor. And my hero, Jon Stewart, told it like it was. <laughs> Just fucking nice lady. Right? I think, love him. I think backlash and backlash is a sign that you're doing something right. It is 
what happens when you challenge the status quo and you move to a new road order. And today, a typical rider looks like the guy on the right rather than the Mad Max messenger on the left. And it's a major step. Bikes being used for commuting, for getting around, even getting married. I know, we didn't even stage that one. <laughs> so good. And it's popular. People are way ahead of the press and the politicians when it comes to their streets. Uh, at the last poll taken at the end of the Bloomberg administration, 73% support for bike share, 72% support for plazas, 64% support for bike lanes. Uh, any politician today would have loved these numbers. If this was an election, it would be a landslide. And we saw just how much it changed about a year ago when the next administration wanted to take uh, away Times Square, put the cars back in to deal with the hello kitties and you know, Minnie Mouses that were soliciting tips from tourists. Um, and let's just say that it didn't go over well. Um, once the idea was floated, New Yorkers rushed to defend the plazas in Times Square and all of the plazas acro across the city. Six years ago, people were so opposed to taking the cars out of Times Square, and six years later, they couldn't imagine putting them back in. It was a new status quo. And as you heard from our earlier speakers, we, there, it is an exciting time, and there are all sorts of new possibilities with technology uh, that are coming along. And imagine in the new, not too distant future, this street could be any street in America, and all of that empty asphalt being put to new use. And driverless cars hold the promise of making streets more uh, efficient and effective, shrinking the width of our lanes, eliminating parking, and repurposing all that empty asphalt for affordable housing and green infrastructure like walking and biking. But as we've seen, there are new possibilities in our streets right now that are hidden in plain sight. It isn't easy. It is a fight. It is a street fight to make more space for people, but it is a fight that we can win. It is a fight that we must win, because when you change the street, you change the world. Thank you.